So we can begin. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm Denis Tolyorov. I'm an assistant curator here at Pushkin House. Um, thank you for coming here and deciding to spend this Sunday with us. Uh, thank you, everybody, who are joining us online. So we have two cameras, so people will be able to see you. And we have um, 30 people joining us from all over the world, mainly the US. Um, so uh, that's brilliant, and I just wanted to say that it is one of the lows, uh, one of the longest projects that we had in our pipeline. So Hilda and Anna uh, approached us a year and a half ago, so <laughs> before the invasion, and they were, and I, I think we basically only started working at that time with our new team after COVID, and Anna was like. Uh, uh, can we uh, do think uh, we, we should organize this event in April 2023? And I'm like, April 2023, is it going to happen? Uh, and then obviously, you know, um, the wars, I mean, the invasion started um, and uh, we were canceling a lot of cultural events. Then, you know, we realized that we can start uh, doing cultural events again. So a lot, so many things um, have changed, but you know, 23rd of April, 2023 has always been in our calendar and in our hearts. <laughs> so um, thank you for organizing that. And I look uh, forward to today's event as much as everybody else. Thank you so much, Dennis. So my name is Helda Hochenbaum, and I am a professor of Russian at Arizona State University. And I have been working on uh, the Khlashenskaya sisters for over 20 years. Uh, so there are a number of Slavists who over two generations, and now we have involved a third and even a fourth generation uh, uh, working on the Khlashenskaya sisters. And we decided that it was time to kind of bring everybody together so that we could all see each other and could uh, start to kind of ha uh, multiply our efforts uh, in many directions. And so we've just had a conference at uh, Clare College in Cambridge, uh, which Anna Berman organized. And uh, this is then the third day of that conference, uh, which brings our translators together. But our translators have already been working together because we also are uh, putting together streams of panels for the professional conferences. So uh, it's the American, uh, the Association of Slavic and East European Studies uh, in the United States. And so we did that last year. We're going to be doing that next year again. Uh, we also have a website that we've started at the Slavic Reference Service at the uh, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And there will be a conference uh, in uh, Illinois next year through the um, uh, Association of Women in Slavic Studies in the United States. Uh, so there are many parts to this. And uh, to those of you who are uh, watching the YouTube channel, uh, if you're interested in joining us, if you're uh, a Slavist uh, in any way, if you're a translator and you're interested in joining us, uh, please be in touch. This is a, an open project. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, I look forward to the presentations from our translators. And so I'm going to say a few words about uh, Nadezhda Khlashenskaya. She's one of three writing sisters, so we call them the Russian Bronte sisters, or the K sisters for short. Uh, not everyone can say Khlashenskaya. And so they are uh, like the Bronte sisters uh, from the provinces, from the city of Razan. And uh, they, uh, ha Nadezhda had the longest uh, professional career of all of them, uh, spanning from 1842 to her death in 1889. And uh, a second sister, Sofia, who died in 1865, uh, was, uh, uh, wrote over uh, 20 works. And then the youngest sister, who lived until 1916, so right before the Russian Revolution, uh, she wrote a biography of the sisters, and then she wrote uh, six tales herself. And uh, so uh, Nadezhda Khlashenskaya is uh, not well known today, and so our goal is to make her much more well known. Uh, she was, in fact, the third highest paid writer in Russia after Tolstoy and Turgenev, so well ahead of Dostoevsky in her day. Uh, she wrote over a dozen novels. She wrote over two dozen tales. She was a poet. Uh, she wrote over a hundred poems. She was a literary critic, and she was a translator, translating from uh, French, German, uh, Norwegian, and Italian. And her work was translated into French, Czech, 
uh, Swedish, uh, and, and German. And so uh, there are many uh, unexplored avenues in her work, and so we have gathered together an international team uh, with Russian scholars, French, uh, European, and American scholars uh, working together on all the aspects of her career. And so uh, the translations into English obviously are very important, and uh, our translators today include uh, Karen Rosneck, uh, who translated the first novel by Nadezhda Khoshenskaya back in 2000 with Northwestern University Press, and then Nora Favorov, who uh, translated uh, her sister's novel, Sofia Khoshenskaya's City Folk and Country folk for which she won the uh, American Association of Teachers of Slavic and East European Writers Translation Prize. Uh, and uh, she's also uh, a Pushkin House uh, translator, uh, award-winning translator for other translations that she's done. Um, and then we have uh, younger translators working with us also. Uh, and so uh, we're very pleased uh, that all four translators are here together. Thank you so much. So who's first? Hello. Um, I'll start with just a few words about myself. Um, so I became obsessed with Russian language, literature, and culture, and history when I was in college my senior year and just on a uh, lark kind of took, took Russian language my last year of college uh, because I was taking Russian history at the same time and became obsessed with all things Russian. And uh, for a while I couldn't make a, couldn't figure out how to make a career out of that. But eventually I, I started translating and wanted to translate literature. Uh, that's a tough thing to make a living at, but little by little um, I, 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 I did some throughout that career, but mostly I translated history, including a biography of Stalin that won the Pushkin House um, Best uh, Book in Translation Award in 2016. So that brought me here in... Um, uh, seven years ago. So anyway, it's, it's great to be back. Um, oh, and, and I, when I was getting my master's degree, I was encouraged by my advisor to look at 19th century women, which were unjustly ignored um, by scholars and readers and translators and publishers. Um, and so I read, I sampled all of the 19th century Russian women writers and fell in love, and particularly with Sofia and, and Nadezhda, now that I've read more of her, um, they definitely deserve more attention than they have gotten. Um, so the story I'm going to be reading from is an 1858 uh, work called um, Bratitz, which uh, for the moment at least, the, the title we have is The Brother. Um, all those uh, nice endings that get put onto Russian words, they are so hard to capture in English. So. So this is um, a completed translation that is, we're currently in the process of um, writing a proposal to, to get it published. So I'm going to start with the very beginning. Uh, it's, a, it's a novella, a povist. The village of Akulyeva is just 20 versts from the provincial seat of N, but it lies along a country road skirted by gullies, Reaching it involves traversing two steep hills and making one frightfully precipitous descent down to the river. So communication with the town of N and with the rest of the inhabited world is extremely difficult and almost impossible during muddy times of the year. Nevertheless, the village has, has existed in this world for a very long time and continues to prosper, so its inhabitants are apparently not bothered by the incommodities of their wilderness and have no need for the city. The village, the village belongs to a noble family, several generations of Chirkins, in whom a passion for home life has grown with each generation. As is customary, the previous proprietor settled in the countryside the day he retired from military service and married. In other words, a little more than 40 years ago. It was three years before he left, it was three years before he left Akulyeva once to travel to N for the elections, and once for the special occasion of seeing off his 10-year-old son when a relative took him away from Akulyeva to attend school in St. Petersburg. Of course, this inactivity did nothing to increase Chirkin's fortune. 
The revenue generated by his holdings did not increase even in Akulovo, where he lived, to say nothing of the two other villages he never checked in, never checked in on uh, in a neighboring province. He died 15 years before the beginning of this story, leaving his wife, three daughters, and his son all these estates, which were free of debt, but by then in a state of some disarray. He expressed concern for the future only, only in that as he was dying, he allotted portions of the estates to his son and eldest daughter, who were already of age, and indicated what portion should go to the two younger daughters and left the guardianship in the hands of his wife, their mother, to whom he bequeathed Akulyova. Lyubov Sergeyevna Chirkina continued to live there with her daughters. Her son had long since concluded his studies and was in government service in Petersburg. After being taken away to school, he had returned home only once for one vacation. However, when he learned of his father's death, he hurried home to soothe his mother and generally make arrangements. One could hardly say that his arrival had a soothing effect. A young man, Sergei Andreevich, was then 25, brought up far from provincial rusticity. He had his own understandings, his own way of seeing things, and he was somewhat stern and somewhat fastidious. Nobody in Akulyeva was used to that. He amazed people with his knowledge of the productive capacity of this corner of the earth and was so demanding of what he apparently felt was his due that contradicting him was out of the question. Then again, who would ever undertake to contradict him? His mother was put into a flutter by her son's knowledge and grandeur, but at the same time was so overjoyed by this reunion with her Serzhenka um, after such a long separation uh, that she could only choke with emotion at the sight of him and tell others about his feats in the service with the same rapture she had formerly, formerly put into recounting the brilliance and successes of his childhood. Sergei Andreevich was the son his parents had been praying for. His older sister, Praskovia Andreevna, who had come into the world a year earlier, was not warmly welcomed by her parents, who had been dreaming of a son. He was adored from infancy, and fate did everything in its power to reserve this adoration for him alone. Six sons, later born out of the happy Chirkin marriage, all died before ever reaching an interesting age, the age when sensible thought first appears, so no clear memory of the unfortunate children remained. One can imagine the despair Lyubov Sergeyevna felt oh, when she had to part with this treasure, with Serzhenka, and relinquished him to his far-off studies. Serzhenka rarely wrote, even when he was a schoolboy. He was constantly short of time, to say nothing of later. Oh, even as a schoolboy, he was constantly short of time, to say nothing of later. But he was meticulous in remembering his parents' birthdays and saints' days, and had a talent for timing things so that his congratulations were received on the very day of the celebration. However, if the letters would be late or early due to the postal schedule, Serzhenka turned this into an opportunity for particular fervency. Let me be the first before all others to throw myself into your embrace, dearest parents, or now that the congratulatory clamor has long since died down around you, I rejoice that my voice will no longer be drowned out by the voices of outsiders, and so forth. Sergei Andreevich either failed to consider or simply forgot that it was his sisters he was calling outsiders. He had little knowledge of them, but they remembered him well. When he came for that vacation, he was 19, and his sisters were 20 and 11. The third had yet to be born. The only thing he told his sister Vera was that she didn't know anything and lacked gracefulness, and he observed to his sister Praskovia, in front of their parents, that she ought to attend to the child and that that is a woman's duty to love children and care for them. Their mother marveled at Serzhenka's mind and heart. <laughs> Little Vera began to fear him and would run away or even hide if she encountered him in the garden. Praskovia Andreevna, being bored, as would any young woman, condemned to spend the best years of her youth in a godforsaken desolate village, plucked up the courage to start a conversation with her brother. He was so learned, and she, a few months earlier, had had a governess, an ignorant but kind woman who didn't teach her pupil anything and read the most stirring uh, poetry and rhapsodic, though quite chaste, novels with her. The governess was dismissed under the pretext of cost, and so that Praskovia Andreevna herself could work with her younger sister. 
Whether Sergei Andreevich was aware of this reason when he recommended this occupation to his sister or the idea just came to him out of a didactic inclination, either way, he hit the mark in terms of his parents' thinking and desire. He somehow had a talent for hitting it. Another reason the governess was dismissed was that more money had to be sent to Sergei Andre Andreevich, who had gone on to higher education. His sister knew this reason. Having grown up involved in the practical and financial running of the estate, she knew the arithmetic. And she also knew that letting, him, letting her keep her friend would not have brought ruin or straightened brother financially. And would it really be so bad if brother had to deprive himself a bit? He wouldn't be the only one. Then again, after once letting this thought run through her mind, Praskovia Andreevna did not return to it, instead using her brother's visit to try to cultivate a relationship with him. She tried to talk to him about her feelings, about her boredom. Sergei Andreevich joked, laughed, and finally sternly told his sister to stop her foolishness. Their parting was not cool or stiff, but somehow odd. Praskovia Andreevna breathed more easily after brother left, but was pained contemplating the nice time they might have had together, and why had they gotten on so badly? Then, a few months later, <clears throat> when the dream of a first love glimmered in the pretty young recluse, something distant and vague that was not destined to be expressed or realized, when her heart was in turn pained and joyous, and she felt an urge to confide this joy and sorrow in someone, Praskovia Andreevna started to think about her brother with tenderness and repentance. She felt guilty as if it was she who had rejected his friendship, that he was kind, affectionate, attentive. He's so smart. She worked up her resolve and wrote him a letter full of the sweetest, most touching and naive half confessions, the bitterest, as she was resigned to her fate, complaints of the tedium and emptiness of her life, of her tedious and prosaic existence, of her lack of friends in society. This letter was sent surreptitiously. God alone knows with what trepidation. For his response, Praskovia Andreevna gave her brother the, ad the address of the clerk's wife, an old woman who loved her, and the only person outside her family with whom she was close. Praskovia Andreevna awaited a response, and it came sooner than expected. Her parents received a letter from Serzhenka. After informing them of his successes in conveying regards to his father from his superiors, who did not know him, and his to his mother, regards from their wives, who had not the slightest idea of her existence, and having grandiloquently described the funeral of some important personage or other, Sergei and Andreevich begged pardon for having to cut short this pleasant conversation with the beloved originators of his existence and perform a duty that was extremely distressing to him, responding to his sister's letter, which had astonished him. What a blow these lines were for Praskovia Andreevna, who was always made to read Serzhenka's letters out loud. Um, what was it like for her to read his drawn-out callous and scathing admonition full of mockery, bile, and a desire to edify and impress? The revelation of this secret did not get her into trouble, since this secret, nor she herself, were seen as being of any great significance. Nevertheless, additional constraints on her daily life were contrived, and she was treated with greater strictness. Praskovia Andreevna, of course, was not able to clearly work out her feelings, but one thing was clear to her. She did not like her brother. So began their acquaintance. Later, when Sergei Andreevich came to the village after his father's death, he found his older sister not yet old, of course, but subdued and silent. So it was hard to figure out or understand what she was thinking or feeling. The entire house was silent, and not just from grief over the passing of the paterfamilias, but because silence had become a habit. The second sister, the 17-year-old Vera, who was unattractive and sickly, was so shy that she blushed and became flustered at the slightest word. The third, the five-year-old Katya, whom her brother had never met, had been raised in an atmosphere of strictness and obedience and received protection and affection only from her oldest sister. Whatever emotions Praskovia Andreevna may have felt, only one was clearly evident. She loved Katya to distraction. Her youngest, her, younger, her youngest sister was like a, a daughter to her. Into Praskovia Andreevna's almost returnal, maternal feelings were blended all the sorrow she felt about her own difficult childhood and wasted youth, and all the grief she felt over the cold emptiness of her present life. 
There was not much that she could teach Katya, and she did not push her to study. She didn't have the heart to force the child to work hard. All she wanted was for this child to be cheerful, for her to be made happy somehow by whatever means. She dressed her up as best she could since the 25-year-old didn't have anything at her disposal and sometimes had to go to great lengths to dress up her sister, her doll. Sergei Andreevich told her that this was lunacy. As you wish, Praskovia Andreevna responded frostily. Why should she be accustomed to finery that her sisters were not accustomed to, her brother reasoned. This conversation took place in front of their mother. Sergei Andreevich generally liked to make his observations in front of others. He was certain of the infallibility of his opinions and saw no reason to hide them. You would call a blended wool dress finery, Praskovia Andreevna asked in the same frosty tone. Sergei Andreevich superbly explained that there is but a single step from trifles to dire consequences and that women are generally obstin obstinate, empty-headed, and short-sighted. He spoke eloquently. It was easy to make an impression on women who had never heard such lengthy speeches. He expressed himself so sternly, pointedly, and with such an awareness of his own superiority, his excellent education, and the paltriness of his audience, that this audience, like it or not, was compelled to be in awe of him. For his mother, he was a miracle. Mothers can be deluded. And as a consequence of endless praise in childhood, and as a consequence of love displayed too conspicuously, including an unceremonious preference over the other children, the object of their delusions seems unapproachably grand, omniscient, and accomplished when they grow up and are able to deftly manipulate those who unconditionally adore them. Fate had bestowed this ad advantageous position on Sergei Andreevich Chirkin. Serzhenka was handsome, intelligent, obedient, witty, and so on. Serzhenka was hardworking, honored his parents, and so on. Serzhenka was unsparing in his labors on behalf of the fatherland, attained respectable ranks while still young, was judicious beyond his years, attentive to his mother, and clever. Oh, was he clever. And through her pondering of all this, Lyubov Sergeyevna, the mother, uh, created an idol out of her Serzhenka. She listened when he spoke, literally motionless, because she was taking in not only his words, but every sound of every word, even if he was pronouncing banalities. She was beside herself if anyone contradicted him, or even if they agreed with him. For her, this was not enough. She felt there was something wrong in the way they were agreeing with him. If he wanted something, even just a glass of water too slow in coming, his mother became agitated, as if the whole world was rising up to thwart Serzhenka. She was never meek, but for her son, she could be a horror. She herself worshipped him and demanded that everyone else do so as well. It is remarkable that Sergei Andreevich took this all as his due with great dignity and very aloofly. If his mother exclaimed while talking about the perplexing state of affairs on the estate, Oh, Serzhenka, you're my only hope. He would reply self-assuredly, Yes, of course, you know absolutely nothing about anything. And this was received as perfectly just. If his mother complained of some malady, Sergei Andreevich explained to her that she had eaten too much and with extraordinary accuracy recalled everything that she had eaten over the past two or three days. The evidence was irrefutable. There was no point in arguing. There was nothing left but to resign herself to several lectures on intemperance. If Lyubov Sergeyevna took it into her head to entertain her idol, and began telling him some story, she could clearly see by his expression that he was already weary and that he was only listening out of courteous condescension to allow her the pleasure of speaking. More often than not, he walked away without saying a word, simply getting up and leaving when she had barely finished her story. On other occasions, he would all of a sudden start thoughtfully probing for details, forcing her to repeat herself, making observations, drawing conclusions, and wonder of wonder, it emerged that the people whom Lyubov Sergeyevna had considered intelligent and had wanted to portray that way were fools, or the other way around. It's probably about all we have time for now. <laughs> so do we want to see if there are any questions, or should we just wait till everyone is done? 
maybe very briefly, we want to leave time for the other translators, but if there's any burning questions that anybody would like to just ask about that. One interesting thing is the name uh, Serzhenko, which is actually, the stress mark is, is marked in the story. For those of you who know Russian, Seryozhenko would be the typical nickname, but I guess it was like um, an affectation, like Serge in French. Um, <laughs> so. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Oh, right. And of course, I wanted to say that in Pierre Baidba, the translation to which I'm about to read, the main narrator is also Serge. And he depicts him, he only refers to himself as Serge, uh -huh. while his father, who is trying to, uh, to speak to him only in Russian, always calls him just Serge. So uh -huh. I wonder if why, why, what, what is it about this name that for Foshinska <laughs> was so kind of, uh, <laughs> she liked to use for unlikable narrators and characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, okay, very good. So you have a microphone? No, no, you can use that uh, there. Mm -hmm. But she is the next speaker, so oh, I'll just turn this <laughs> one. Oh, I have one. Oh. So in Russian, I believe this is 35 pages. No, it's longer than that. Longer? Oh, and my PDF, it was, oh, it's probably double that. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I was wondering how it would be published as a single book. Would it be maybe in English, a hundred pages? Sorry, it's a novella. <laughs> um, it, it's long enough for a fairly skinny book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that was only what I read was a very small part of it. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Pushkin House, Hilda, Anna, for organizing this and inviting me. My name is Anastasia Kostrukova. I'm a graduate student at New York University. Um, as part of my dissertation, I came across, um, uh, as part of my dissertation research, I came across uh, Pierre Barba, uh, an 1869 novel uh, by Nadezhda Hvochinska in Atechstvinnyi Zapiski. Uh, and from then, I fell in love with this text and the idea to translate it came around and we started to discuss uh, the idea of it more and more. And now I am um, almost completed my first draft and I wanted to share some of my initial translations of this text with you. I wanted to start by introducing the text first and to talk about a little bit about the plot of um, the uh, novel or the novella that's still uh, up for a discussion <laughs> of what generic function you want to offer it. So, um, uh, Nadezhda Hvoshinska, in um, describing her text to a good friend of hers, um, Olga Novikova, in 1869, writes, it is a bit cynical, but what can you do? In short, it is a story of a rogue, which he narrates himself and so objectively that even the author's shadow isn't visible. Um, Pierre Barba, uh, The First Struggle, offers a glimpse into an imaginary solution of a young man of poor origin to reality's contradiction. The 27-year-old Sergei writes the story of his childhood and youth from the position of wealth and power that he has achieved sometimes by the mid-1860s interpreting his early steps as a struggle in asserting and developing his strength and will to success. He was born into a poor, arguably petty gentry or as Nachinsi family sometimes in the 1840s and lost his mother as a little five-year-old boy. Stricken with grief and unable to care for the boy as if by providential deus ex machina logic, his father gives him up to be adopted and educated by one of his distant wealthy aristocratic relatives in Moscow. Sergei claims that the spontaneous mobility upwards to an aristocratic life of the Moscow salons was a rightful occurrence in light of his natural talents and inherent superiority. He remains within this privileged social realm for almost a decade until his poor but moral father reappears and takes Sergei to a small provincial town against the boy's wish to remain within his adopted family. 
There, the boy is forced to study in the gymnasium, which he believes to be too prosaic for his natural talents, and mingle with peers who he believes are unworthy of his gracious er uh, company. Ironically, he proves to be a bad student and is often shunned by his peers for his arrogance. None of these facts, however, are convincing enough to make Sergei doubt his sense of superiority, justified in his mind by natural talent, inherent aesthetic taste, and the complementing finesse of his aristocratic Bildung. Sergei's socially affluent aunt continues to send him money, allowing him to secretly affor afford small luxuries to which he became accustomed in his early years. When his father learns of the secret, he forbids the correspondence, and Sergei is forced to give French lessons for some extra earnings. In the family of, this young of his young student, he encounters seemingly warm, kind, and rather sentimental people with whom he shares no common moral coordinates, no understanding. His appearance in the family disrupts its calm existence built on traditional provincial moors, stirring up an array of problems and miseries. At this time, Sergei's father dies, a death for which Sergei is partially uh, responsible for, leav leaving him with a very small inheritance insufficient to sustain his needs and desires. And this forced return to the, mod uh, to the modest existence and of this vulgar, dull life that he constantly describes again and again, um, becomes the sort of dramatic point in the narrator's life. It, p it sparks the desire to return by any possible means to the higher position which he believes he was naturally meant to occupy. And yet, instead of an, uh, initiating an active pursuit of various opportunities to ensure this return, for the larger part of the narrative, Sergei is more concerned with sustaining and upholding his intricately built delusional imaginary of an ir aristocrat, or more correctly, the Svetsky Chelavek, to himself and to the provincial community around him. Sergei ignores his modest origin, insisting on his natural superiority and aristocratic nature, and distinguishes himself from the traditional social climbers of his time. In his opinion, the gradual social mobility that one could expect within the life of the bureaucratic service is too slow and not worthy of someone with his natural talents and tastes. So thus, the narrative constitutes a series of malicious acts by Sergei, culminating to the largest one of them all, the psychological manipulation of a wealthy bourgeois woman for the sake of taking full possession of her wealth, driving her towards a monastic life, and using newly possessed wealth to catapult himself back to the metropolis's pleasurable life. At the conclusion of the novella, or the novel, we learn that this woman was the first of the many victims of Sergei's path to success. Um, um, today I brought two little uh, uh, small passages for you. I decided to, it was important for me to uh, first read the introductory notes uh, to this text that Sergei offers as a kind of setting the tone for the novel. And then I brought to you a dialogue that happens between Sergei and his father towards the middle of the novel, where I think some of these ideological tensions between them are very much um, uh, visible. So, endlessly, wherever I turn, I hear complaints that life breaks people, that the society in which they find themselves and the elders with power over them force them to betray themselves, go against their own inclinations, waste their strength, and become petty. In this difficult and intense struggle, the skills that could otherwise bring benefit to society and happiness to those who possess them perish. I hear these laments most often from the people of my own generation, just becoming actively engaged in life. I am sick of them. I'm not even 30 and I've endured enough. Not less, if not more than these lamenters. In fact, more. A moral struggle fell on my lot almost from childhood. No one could have accused me of faint-heartedness if I had been transformed alone, without example or counsel, without friendship or support. It was even within my rights to become petty. I didn't. I have jotted down some notes about the struggle of my early youth. It encompasses everything that has guided me throughout my life. And while my subsequent life may have been richer in drama, its whole essence is contained in this beginning. This miserable story is filled with meaning. I am not calling this story a confession. I myself don't find, and I assume no rational person will either, anything in my actions and motives that would weigh on the conscience. 
The sort of thing for which one customarily shows remorse or for which a public repentance is considered a heroic deed. I would also not call this story a revelation. There is nothing embarrassing nor sensitive of the sort that might be shared in times of need or out of sentimental passion. I do not feel passion. There is no one to whom I feel attracted by this treacherously silly feeling. I also have no practical necessity to explain my actions. I don't feel the need to justify myself nor to confide in anyone. I am content with myself. I know. I have heard the common reproach for words like this more than once. But what if they are sincere? Moreover, what if the feeling that provoked them is justified? Anyone with full self-awareness who voices them, must he, in fact, can he be reproached for being proud? But let us assume that he can. But what if this pride is legitimate? A pride like this has the right to guide. A man who survived in the struggle has the right to set himself as an example to all the petty whiners vain loud mouths and daydreaming phrase mongers. And yet I'm becoming infected by their example. I'm becoming too excited. No, they're not worthy. These gentlemen are not important enough for me to become concerned or seriously uh, argue with them. I'm simply tired of them. I will be understood by people with a more delicate sensitivity but perhaps even those who lament that they're broken by life, appalled by the crudeness of their social milieu, the meagerness of their daily bread and the constriction of thought, would give some thought to my story. With hand on heart, they might compare their tribulations to mine and admit that they're not the only ones who sometimes have it hard, as they would put it. I have an excellent memory. This fortuitous ability has enhanced my development in many ways. The circumstances, even of my early childhood, the people, the setting, I see them all as clear as day. As I write, I will not constrain myself as to which images I choose. Perhaps the ones at my fingertips won't be the most vivid. So what? As in life, whenever I'm fulfilling my desires, I would say, this is as it should be. So too, in this story, I will give into the mood of the moment, whatever it calls for, so it shall be. No matter the result, my individuality will be distinguished from the gray backdrop of my surroundings, of my milieu, which had every capability and intention of devouring me. Okay, and now to the dialogue. <coughs> the next day, exhausted and desperate, I was sitting by my father. I believe he was reading a newspaper and from time to time initiating conversations about social concerns of the day. I promised myself a thousand times never to engage in these discussions, but I was upset, did not control myself well, and could not resist the temptation. For some reason, he brought up the inequality of social estates. I remember this conversation almost word for word. It was the last one of its kind. In light of this enormous inequality, said I, I do not think it is reprehensible to use any means available to reward oneself for the unfairness of one's fate, no matter what these means are. And what are these means exactly, asked my father. All kinds, I, asked, I answered fervently. Others have everything. I have nothing. This justifies everything. I could be made happy with a trifle that somebody else would be deprived of. And what do you mean by deprived of, he interrupted again. Whichever way it happens. For instance, you recently reprimanded Ignatia and I for not stealing thousand rubles ourselves and putting the blame on real thieves instead. You have an excellent memory, said I. I see, and you really don't consider stealing a sin. I asked him to explain the meaning of sin. Perhaps having figured out that mystical threats are useless tricks on me, he answered, any baseness. That is quite vague. How should one understand this word? Anything for which society has the right to beat you, he answered coolly. But what if, what if society is so exquisitely arranged that it pushes man to extremes, I cried out. Who are you talking about, he interrupted. Peasants in the years of famine, workers without work? Aha, that was his real forte. I do not engage with these worn out questions, I replied indifferently to show him once again how much they bore me. Then who are you referring to? An educated person. An educated person will always find some bread. In a crude milieu in which his knowledge and talents are rejected? 
there is no such milieu. Okay, then the one in which they're useless. Then he will find himself a simpler pursuit, a craft. He is not capable of that. He will learn. He has no power to learn. It is not difficult. It is not difficult only for someone who does not have to surpass himself in order to stand on the same level with the stupid crowd. For someone whose education is so insignificant that they would e easily toss it into vulgarity. Yes, perhaps, he said calmly, not noticing or not wanting to notice my obvious hint at his past. Perhaps in this you are also correct. It is difficult for a genius or for an especially talented man to overcome himself to put aside his own work and to take on the dirty work of the common people. But in our century, geniuses and men of talent never face such extreme circumstances. They have their own paths, but an ordinary, educated person would not be burdened or feel squeamish about manual labor. Subsequently, stealing will not be a necessity after all. He will not die of hunger. Who is saying anything about a hungry death here? I cried out. You do not and cannot understand me. I speak of the highest needs of an educated man. You think that an educated man feels secure when he has a piece of bread, a civil service job, scholarly books, merchant friends, and cheap amusements. But he cannot, simply cannot. It is not in his power to be content with all this, to crawl into a corner, resign himself, in the s and suffer the pangs of talent. One has to be a hero in order to endure this suffering. This me man needs air, brilliance, success, luxury, a life full of every satisfaction. Society looks to him full of expectation. Satisfaction is his duty. So, he interrupted, now I finally understood what you really mean by an educated man. But what can society expect from these fine fellows? Everything I explained. These people are the light of society. They keep it from drowning in mediocrity. They develop its tastes in its imagination. They stimulate its needs worthy of the highest value of men. They stimulate power and industry. Nations become wealthy because of these people. Yes, without a doubt. If not for the refined needs of these people, your peasant men would only know their plows, and the peasant women would continue weaving their sackcloths, and we would continue building only these dumps we call warm apartments. I gestured around myself. They force others to labor. By their mercy, the activity of the masses is boiling. These rails of the railroads, these thousands of utilized machines, these exhibitions, theaters, comforts, innovations, everything. And I mean everything is motivated by this thirst for pleasure that nature has thrust into the breast of these supreme people. These fertile thirst that flares up into a life-giving flame. I was eloquent as never before. Sometimes early youth invigorates such urges, such happy minutes of inspiration. They need witnesses. They need an attentive crowd. But sometimes destiny permits that this ardor subsides in solitude, or worse, burns out instantaneously when confronted with the absurdity of crude misunderstanding. These people are gods, I explained in conclusion. Everything for them, because without them there is nothing. From which follows, said my father, listening to me coldly, that at the end of the day, even the geniuses who teach and the self-sacrificing talents who labor on equal footing with the simple folk are laboring for the same educated elites. But life is long. How do they occupy themselves throughout their lifetime? They live, I answered ecstatically. By the sweat and blood of others, he said quietly, with an expression that I have never seen on his face before. It appeared only for a second, but lingered in my memory I often regretted that I'm not an artist. I would capture the face of this indignant plebeian on canvas. He stood up, paced around the room, and continued to stay silent. You know what, Sergei, he said, stopping in front of me? You're now 17, and I'm 40. It hasn't been too long, but I'm starting to feel slightly nauseated. It is too late for us to get along. I wanted to say that it is actually impossible, but he did not let me begin. But we're closely related. I'm still responsible for your opinions and actions. I believe I never gave you reason, any reason to blush for me, I interrupted. A hundred times, he practically cried out, becoming irritated, but immediately fell silent, having perhaps figured out that composure is his only advantage. He just flushed, went pale, and started to pace around the room again. I remained silent and turned to the window. A man in grief knows not what he does. He began as if telling a story to someone. I should have never given you up there. He motioned to the side with his head. 
but I felt pity. She died. I wanted to offer a better home to the child and found a crooked nest. Have they no fear of God to ceaselessly rear, rear such people? Or do they not know what they do? No, they know, but they live too well. Good gods. I smiled and I did not object. I lost the mood to speak. The restless and agonizing thought about my desperate situation resurfaced again. Sergei, this is our fourth year living together. He continued pacing around and thereby expressing everything even more incoherently than it was brewing, than was it was brewing in his mind. Perhaps our poor abode does not satisfy your taste. F forgive me, there are no more means. You know this, you know everything. I never concealed anything from you. You must admit that I did not refuse you in anything and never moralized. I let you carry out your actions in accordance with your own will. I myself have been nothing but genuine with you. You saw me, you knew me, and subsequently you knew whom I wanted you to be. I trusted you, um, quite uh, I trusted you always and quite entirely. Of course, you concealed a lot from me, but I did not interfere. Only recently, I must admit, I found out about your relationship with your aunt. Monsieur, I exclaimed, jumping off my seat. <laughs> I saw you had some new and useless things. You started to frequent the theater. Monsieur, I repeated, you spied on me. Bah, he cried out. I thought you were gambling. And after all this, I'm not responsible for myself. I would have thought you were stealing. I became pale from fear. He really could have found out that I gambled. <laughs> I did not spy on you. You gave yourself away, he continued. At some point, you were running to Father Pavel three days in a row. And you followed me and asked around? Yes, I followed and asked around. Was this a long time ago? Since you stopped receiving any letters or money from your aunt, he replied and started to laugh. I cannot remember what happened with me next. In horror, I could only reply, you wrote to her? Yes. How dare you, I shouted. The truth is yours. I'm a despot. But you have lied to me for three years. And this is your revenge to leave me with no means? He did not reply and paced around silently. How should one desc describe your actions? I continued in despair. Can you properly support me so that it could n I would not feel ashamed, at least in front of those idiots you have thrust upon me as my friends? Is it within your means to assure that I could pass my time in a somewhat dignified manner? Do you have an, a social circle where wit and talent were valued? What can you reward me with? What can you give me? And you have robbed me. I remember here one instant of compassion. I looked at his face. He seemed to me so struck, so destroyed, as if he had only now understood the significance of his actions. I felt uneasy tormenting him under my gaze and turned away. This, of course, was enough for him to regain his composure. Of course, you don't expect, he spoke coldly, but I heard a tremble in his voice, that I would immediately offer you money. I can begin by saying that I do not have any, and if I did, I would find a better place for it. Look at yourself. You're not a beggar nor a cripple in order to live from charity. If you are in urgent need, earn something. If you want to have fun, do something to deserve it. With diligence and good behavior, I interrupted and started to laugh, but then couldn't hold back and laugh through tears. Yes, he said somehow quietly and strangely, then maybe I would also reward myself for diligence and good behavior together with you. You, I cried out, feeling beside myself, what could be possibly shared together? You broke my relationship with my tante. Have you considered that my tante and her family are the only ones for me in the world, that I have no one else? I did not finish speaking. My chest was being ripped apart with my sobs. I imagined my poverty, helplessness, and moral humiliation. I imagined Karmakov, all the questions and jibes. I would have liked to faint. Father was standing and looking out the window. Maybe all of this is as you say, he finally, he said, finally speaking with difficulties as if his throat was parched. But as I said already, I'm still responsible for you and I have to make sure that you will not completely humiliate yourself in front of others. With me, you can be whatever you want. He went to his room. I drank some water, sent Melania to the pharmacy for some laurel cherry drops and pondered my situation. I decided not to see my father that day nor the next. That was not so difficult. The autumn days were beautiful. I left for a walk and came back la late in the evening. My father was out. The walk refreshed me. I drank tea alone in my room, uh, wrote a long letter to my tante, and fell asleep before my father returned.
Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I've really enjoyed this. I wonder what, how you will translate the title and what you think the title means in terms of the work. Uh, I will translate it as my, uh, the first struggle. And that to me is actually very significant as it actually ties to my own work. Um, uh, because I believe that, uh, or at least it would be my argument, my claim, that this work is written out of a sort of post-Darwinian spirit, uh, when the ethos of struggle for existence is in the air. And so I've seen previous translation of this uh, as first battle, I believe, but I, my proposition would be to, to really reinterpret it in, this in following this direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question online. Um, so, um, actually, that might be a question to any speaker, but could you tell, please, if prototypes of uh, heroes and heroines are important and possible to reconstruct from authors' letters? I, I would have difficulty answering this question um, affirmatively. Uh, thank you for this interesting question. So uh, in, in Russian literature, in the kind of middle of the 19th century and later, there's this idea of writing according to social types, uh, if I understand your question correctly. So you have, uh, for example, the idea is to somehow capture kind of what is happening historically at the moment and in, in, into a kind of literary character. And so one of the most famous social types is, for example, the character Bazarov in uh, Turgenev's most famous novel, Fathers and Sons. Um, and so uh, Nadezhda Kleshchenskaya wrote many more novels than Tolstoy <laughs> and uh, Dostoevsky and Turgenev. Um, and she has a variety of characters and she's especially interested in provincial characters. And so uh, I think there's just a, a larger variety than these very, very specific uh, literary types. And uh, so of course she is responding to the literature of the time. And uh, she is most clearly responding to, uh, she's writing very much in the anti-nihilist tradition. So the nihilist uh, and Dostoevsky is also writing in the anti-nihilist tradition. And so uh, a character like Bazarov uh, for Nadezhda Khlashinskaya is someone who is putting uh, very, uh, uh, kind of very selfish principles first. And so uh, this is a character who is supremely selfish. Does that sound? Actually, one, uh, on that note, I just wanted to say that from the novel itself, it is uh, obvious that um, Sergei is basing himself or taking his, his idea from Balzac's Père Guru. Yeah. And his yes. father actually criticizes him and says he's doing a major uh, sort of misreading of Balzac's intentions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for that nice question. Thank you for the nice question. Oh, Hilda, in terms of um, the brother, though, would you like to say just a few words about the possible Chekhov con connection? I guess that's me. So um, that's my personal view on this text, but I 
um, Nadezhda Fushinskaya was from a family that had one brother and three sisters and a fourth sister who died as a very small child. So basically, practically speaking, growing up in that model. Um, Chekhov was a fan of her writing and spoke about her. He never wrote anything specifically about Bratyets, but in reading it, I was quite struck that you have three sisters kind of with feeling like their lives are wasting away in the provinces. The youngest one is sort of as the hope of the future. She becomes engaged and her brother squanders away the family's wealth and everything is destroyed and they're left three sisters in the provinces wasting away, which is basically the plot summary of Chekhov's Three Sisters, which was written later. There's no guarantee that he read them, but one thing he did like to play with sometimes is names. So he has quite a few adulterous Annas who are modeled on Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, for example. And here you have um, a brother, Andrei Sergeyevich, modeled on a Sergei Andreevich. So he's taken the family name and swapped them, which sort of makes it seem like his brother is, or the um, Khoshinskaya is the progenitor of his, that is circumstantial, but there's quite a few small points in the text that would suggest he's probably linking back. So that's <coughs> my view of this text, and I don't know, yeah, anyway. So, ooh, we are ready to begin again, and I'll turn down the mic just in a second. Hello, I guess we're back. Um, it, it is green. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so my name is Eric McDonald. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here in person or joining us through the internet. Um, I just also want to mention, before I start, that if you want to see this whole translation, I'll just be reading part of it, but if you just search for Khoshinska meeting, you'll find it right away online. It should pop up right away. Um, so let me just, this is, a little, this is the latest of the four things, I think, that is kind of from toward the end of her career, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about that phase of her career and, and about this work, and then, then just get into the reading. Uh, so in 1879, uh, one critic said that Nadezhda Khoshinskaya's recent short stories were like a musician who was playing alone, not trying to please an audience, not trying to sound like a virtuoso, not afraid to just keep repeating the same theme that she liked and improvise variations on it. And she kept coming back to the theme of someone feeling isolated, even though they were surrounded by people that had once been close to them. And she got to there, but there by simple means, too, that she just drew major characters with just a few minimal lines, and she would take straightforward plots and just use them again in the same cycle. Um, that critic, Nikolai Mikhailovsky, was talking about the cycle of stories called Album, Groups, and Portraits. Um, the story I'm going to read from is called The Meeting, and it was written just a few years later. Um, this meeting, by the way, is Svidanya in Russian, and it is from 1879. There's an unrelated novel called Vstrecha in Russian from 1860. Sometimes that's also called The Meeting in English, but it's two separate things. Um, there's a different critic and writer, uh, Pyotr Babarikin, who grouped the meeting with the stories from album. And it's true that some things about it are like Hoshinskaya's other works from the 1870s. Uh, for example, the type of people that she called apostates come in for some criticism. These are the people who had been vocally pro-reform early in the reign of Alexander II, uh, but abandoned those views as soon as they weren't the dominant fashion anymore. Uh, and to some extent, the meeting has the contrast between really positive and really negative female characters that Babarikin said was typical of, of Khoshinskaya's work. He actually said that Khoshinskaya had created more negative female characters than any other Russian or Western novelist, full stop. <laughs> um, but there are other ways where the meeting is nothing like what uh, Mikhailovsky and Babarikin variously saw in the stories of album. Um, the contrast between positive and negative characters, it's not the simple division into predators and victims that Babarikin sees in some of her other works. And if Mikhailovsky said that album was like a musician playing alone, the meeting could be the concert that's the result of those private rehearsals. Instead of the pointedly minimalist sketches in the earlier stories, 
in the meeting, we come to know a lot about each of the characters, past and present. And even though as you read the story, it seems like the conversations and events just flow naturally without any obvious traces of design. At the end, when you look back on it, you can easily imagine that it's created and structured with an audience in mind. Uh, whenever I translate anything, I'm really aware that if I were a better reader or a better writer, I'd also be a better translator. Uh, but from a translator's point of view, the meeting could have been worse. It's not full of jokes and puns and linguistic play. Uh, and there are a few allusions to poems and operas that people knew better in the 19th century Russian Empire than now. Um, but not that many, and I think it's easy enough for the English reader to see how each quotation works, even if they've never personally read the poetry of Nikolai Shurabina. Uh, one thing that was challenging, though, was getting the 19th century realia right, especially the details that set the story in the southern part of European Russia. Uh, one of the main characters is from the social estate of Adnadvortsi, uh, a group that was common in the south. If state peasants in pre-emancipation Russia were like slaves without masters, Adnadvortsi were like masters without slaves. They had a legal claim to noble status, but they generally did not own serfs. There's a relationship in the meeting between a full-fledged slaveholding nobleman and an Adna Dvorka. And I tried to make it clear that he was courting a woman who is free, but not his social equal, without making the story feel like a history lesson. There are three important characters in the passage that I'm going to read. Alexandra Sergeyevna Tabayeva is a 50-ish noblewoman who's wealthy and has never been married. An old friend of hers, a poet from St. Petersburg named Pyotr Nikolaevich Altasov, has unexpectedly come to visit her on his way south. And the third character is Anna Vasilyevna Tabayeva. Uh, she's the 40-ish widow of Alexandra Sergeyevna's brother. We'll start in the middle of a conversation between the first, of those, first two of those three characters, Alexandra Sergeyevna and Pyotr Nikolaevich. On that subject, do you have a dog? No, why? I thought not. You're too young to start keeping such worthless things. What is your Ruth's name? Anna Vasilyevna. I should very much like to meet her. The sooner, the better. You are intrigued? Altasov started laughing. I shall be discourteous, he said. You said just now that she is the one who keeps house for you. Consequently, I conclude that upon her arrival, the tea I was promised will also arrive. You are incorrigible, Alexandra Sergeyevna said cheerfully. She has vanished today, I don't know why, but it seems fate was listening in on your desire. A squeaky little cart was coming up the road. Altasa put on his pants nez and looked. Alexandra Sergeyevna squinted. Hurry, she shouted, waving a handkerchief. You see how patriarchal we are here. Anna Vasilina always comes on foot, but today, I don't know, she must have found it too muddy, so she made use of our landlord's vehicle. He comes in the evenings to inspect his factory. Hurry, she repeated leaning out over the balcony, as the woman who had just arrived jumped down from the cart and ran in through the gate. Now, right away, said Alexandra Sergeyevna, and she slipped inside, taking advantage of the fact that her guest was looking out at the darkening field, enraptured. Altasev had become enraptured deliberately to give her a chance to leave. The mistress of the house did need to give orders and assess the situation, of course. He had a premonition that his friend would not leave him to the care of her Ruth, he found this pleasant. Generally, he was in perfect bliss. A mild fatigue from the road and the abundance of fresh air had given him an exceptional appetite. And it was strange. All kinds of appetites were stirring. There's a meadow. It'd be nice to rent it out. A candle factory. <laughs> Tons of candles are burned every day, aren't they? There are three wonder-working icons in N, plus monasteries, all that. In any case, a bit more money would be nice. The light of a candle being carried past flickered across the balcony. Alexandra Sergeyevna had passed through the room, not alone. A lock clicked, a key jingled, some order was being given. Been sent to town, said a voice from below in answer to a question. And a young man in a brightly colored shirt galloped out the gate on horseback. The shirt flashed in the distance for a long time. For a long time, the sound of hoofbeats echoed. A hunched over old woman dragged a bundle of wood out of a shed. A few minutes later, a fire lit up in the window of a low building. Smoke wafted through the air. This is to give me a treat, thought Altasov. He found this pleasant. Let her give him a treat. Why not? The old maid had nothing to do, nothing to spend her money on. People eat well in the provinces in general. Creative cooking and fresh ingredients, those were the main points. 
the south that Altasif was on his way to was just a degree or so south of N, and his place of relaxation was the farmstead of some casual friend, a rather bare steppe that abounded with ground squirrels, Kyrgyz people, yurts, sour skins of kumis. She's had kumis too, more power to her. She's making the most of life. Didn't say how much she inherited from her great aunt. Certainly no less than she got from her brother and its capital besides, that's more of a sure thing. But a thousand desiatins and change, not counting the forest, has its appeal. The tenant there, well, this woman's not about to be taken in. Or what would you have to do to take her in? <laughs> Altasif smiled, but no, seriously. Everyone has their vulnerable side. This person's is obvious. Wouldn't want to make a mistake. Should I give it a try? <laughs> They'd played at liberalism in their day, and enough of that. There is much more that this soul had not tried, but hungered to try. She must be 50. More power to her. How is it that no one has thought of this? No one's remembered about that unused capital tucked away. There truly were strange, some strange people in those days, idealists. But they were also the ones who'd come up with the saying about the nanny goat with the golden horns. Maybe people had tried, but clumsily. Well, after 50, no attempt would seem clumsy. Give it a try. <laughs> really, why not? Well, the summer, the Kyrgyz, the ground squirrels. He could make it through that somehow. And then what? Last year, there were still feuilletons, various correspondences. But at present, there wasn't anywhere to latch onto. Some places were full, and some... Altasa found it very unpleasant to recall his break with the editorial board. He pushed it and its details away as best he could, but to portray it all in a different light was something that could be done only in the heat of telling the story to others, when the storyteller himself believed what he was saying. With only himself for an audience, it came out quite unattractive and not at all comforting, quite unflattering for his self-regard. It would have been awkward to approach it from the angle of his convictions, too. But Altasa, with his conciliatory artistic worldview, was always ready to use his convictions to serve anyone and anything. It was after having divined this ability of his that the editorial board proposed that he withdraw. Then he had had to become a civil servant. But what could he say? His position in the service was pitiful. Service in the provinces is more pleasant, not hard to find a post. But even if there weren't one to be found, the house free and clear, you could probably write too, but just now and then for your own satisfaction. Work taken on freely will come more easily. Pieces exposing wrongdoing, but actually curse all that, all of it. Gogol never had the remotest idea of treating his old-fashioned people ironically. A lofty pleasure not to get calluses on your hands, nor overtax your brain, to sleep in a soft bed, eat as much as you like. And a man owes it to himself to achieve this, especially when the opportunity presents itself. <laughs> the tea is ready, Alexandra Sergeyevna said melodiously. Her figure in her tight dress with its train bound up and back was outlined as a silhouette in the bright doorway. She stopped for a moment on the threshold and came closer. Shall I have it served out here? No, replied Altasif. Continuing to look out at the field, he took her hand over his shoulder and kissed it. No, merci. One should never have a hot drink in damp weather. It is already dark, he concluded, turning around. I hadn't noticed, she said, smiling. They were silent for a minute. Shall we go in? She reminded him. Let's, he said, letting go of her hand. He got up. At the samovar on the living room table stood an attractive young person. Altasev, as an artist, noticed right away that a dark colored dress and the even light of the hanging lamp set off the whiteness and freshness of this animated face and these charming hands especially well. He even began to stare for a second. Anna Vasilyevna, said Alexandra Sergeyevna, indicating her. Altasev bowed. We've already seen each other today, he said. You were so kind as to explain to me how to get here. And I regretted it afterward, she replied cheerfully. Honestly. She turned toward Alexandra Sergeyevna. The moment it started to pour, I say to myself, aren't I a fool? I'd even seen the rain cloud. All I had to do was to think to say, wait for me. I'm running from one window to the next. My conscience has given me trouble. The girls laugh at me. The gentleman's cursing you right now, they say. She laughed. Alexandra Sergeyevna gave Altasev a covert glance with a sort of plaintive apology. Altasev answered with a covert glance of his own, sympathetic and forgiving. Anna Vasilyevna was about to pour the tea and stopped herself. Yes, yours is supposed to go in a glass, she said. She went out for a minute, came back, went out again, and brought some rolls and a napkin. 
I'm sorry, she said, laying them out in front of Alexandra Sergeyevna. What with the rain, I was late getting them. They're out of your favorites. This is what there was. Why so much explanation, replied Alexandra Sergeyevna almost inaudibly. How are things there? Is everything in order? Why shouldn't it be? Oh, but how my little ones delighted me today. It's, I don't know even. Imagine Alexandra Sergeyevna, all of Europe, all the major cities and the borders and the rivers and the mountain ranges and the lakes. They took turns showing each other all that on the map, things I hadn't told them about, hadn't assigned. Alexandra Sergeyevna blushed. Pyotr Nikolaevich, try our local town of N pastries, she said in a very loud voice. Would you like some? Anna Vasilina offered, pushing the cream and butter toward him and went on. I don't remember when I was so happy. They were so sweet and so eager. I promised to give them a reward. They brought a panorama here. Did you see the poster? I'll take them to see it. All of them? Well, Alexandra Sergeyevna, it would be a shame to leave anyone out. And why would I? They all did their best and tried equally hard. They started jumping around like goats. Children, she added, laughing with a shrug of her shoulders that somehow came across as quite sweet, as if she were apologizing. And how many of these little ones are there? Asked Altasev. 22. This generosity will cost you a bit, Alexandra Sergeyevna, observed Altasev. What does Alexandra Sergeyevna have to pay for? Objected Anna Vasilyevna. They're my students. To be fair, I won't be the one to pay either. They will. They're the ones I get. She tutors them, Alexandra Sergeyevna said in an aside to Altasev, who nodded. Put more water in mine, Anna Vasilyevna. One moment. Today was just a marvelous day. Now I'm talking about the older girls. They did an exceptional job. We spent the whole time reading those little birds in a foreign land I religiously observe, and yesterday I unlocked the dungeon of my airy captive. She read the poetry fast. The man of letters frowned. What is it they say that these poets are bragging about? That they let the birds go? They should just not have caught them in the first place. But they've even got them praying for mercy on high. That's hypocrisy, they say. I couldn't even keep it together. It was both so funny and so gratifying. It means the children are thinking. It would be better if they understood the beautiful aspects of the work, objected Altasev. Alexander Sergeyevna was visibly agitated. All that is quite unnecessary, she said sharply. Of course. But how much can one ask for the, from the simple repetition of a lesson? To explain the beautiful aspects of the work, you need to know how. You need an artistic feeling for such things. I'll finish being lazy and take them in hand, said Alexandra Sergeyevna, smiling. You want to do that? cried Anna Vasilyevna. What gave you that idea? You used to say your head started hurting when they walked past the windows, and you won't be able to stay in the classroom. I just love it, and even so, it takes some getting used to. Altasev very artfully failed to hear this. He was feeling his side pocket with a worried expression, and then jumping up, he ran out onto the balcony. What have you lost? asked Alexandra Sergeyevna. I'll light the way for you, said Anna Vasilyevna. My cigar case. Thank you, I found it, replied Altasev as he came back inside with the case that had not left his pocket. Here it is. It was on the floor right by the railing. I'm not sure how it managed not to fall into the grass. As you see, it's practically like a suitcase. It holds everything. Cigars, money, letters, travel notes. Travel notes, echoed Alexandra Sergeyevna. Our kind can't help, he replied facetiously. That's what I would miss if they were lost. They wouldn't be. Why ever not? I might not think to have a smoke until morning, and some factory worker might pick up the case and make quite successful use of that metal which is despicable, but not despised. The workers around here are all honest, said Anna Vasilyevna. Although, as is often the case these days, this metal is not in metal form, Altasev went on, not listening. He would burn my non plus ultra like the rankest strong tobacco. Alexander Sergeyevna laughed out loud. And the wind-blown sheets of my notes? Show them to me, she said, holding out her hand. Certainly. But you won't be able to read them. It is a rough draft of a poem in pencil. I write small. She squinted, trying to make out the letters. Anna Vasilina moved the candle closer to her. This help was to the purpose, but it exasperated Alexandra Sergeyevna. I am not blind, she remarked expressively. <laughs> Altasa bent down over the paper from behind her. Mere firmament, she whispered, making an effort and with feeling. No, mute firmament and caps of snow that shelter eager, no, eagles terrible. Leave it, said Altasa, taking the sheet from her fingers. I'll finish it and give it to you. 
Will you dedicate it to me? Publish it? Perhaps. When will that be? Well, someday. No, better than that. When will we see each other again? I don't know. Do you know what I remember just now, this very minute? I do know, because I never forget anything. I remembered how we were once reading your first, your very first bits of nonsense. You bad man, why say that? Do you really think that your talent is not dear to me? Is this your reputation, your name? It's indelible, don't you believe me? Altasa smiled sadly, shrugging. You don't? Perhaps, perhaps. How can you say that? No, I cannot hear that tune. What can I say? I'm extremely grateful to you, you and your kindness. No, no, I will not hear this, no. You know, in these past few minutes, something seems to have happened to you. Tell me, what? Altasif was slow to answer. Tell me. Something did happen, he said, standing and walking back and forth, to the extent the darkness in the densely furnished room permitted. Anna Vasilevna, let me have another glass. Make it strong, Alexander Sergeyevna said to her. Would you like a tartine? You see, I remember all your habits, as long as they haven't changed. That's just the problem. They haven't, he replied, sitting down and starting in on the tea and tartine with an enthusiasm somewhat out of tune with the tenor of his speech. I do not change, and therefore, now, he took a gulp of tea. Now, you asked, when will we see each other? And I had been asking myself, what kept us from seeing each other until now? What? Yes, what? And I mentally settled this question. He quickly looked around. Someone's head had popped in at the door. God! cried Alexandra Sergeyevna. Oh, Anna Vasilevna, that's someone calling you. Anna Vasilevna went out. Altasev paced back and forth. What is it that kept us from seeing each other? asked Alexandra Sergeyevna. Your reluctance, he replied. My reluctance? How? You're independent. You're free. Let us allow that being content with little is a virtue. But it is a virtue that quickly and easily turns into something worse than vice. Apathy, he concluded, lowering his voice. I was horrified by the thought that if, no, it's better not even to ask. Is there really no difference for you between living here in this thicket or over there where one can live and breathe freely, where people enjoy themselves, they have drive? You understand drive, horizons, ambition. Is there really no difference for you between a candle factory and the wonders of nature, the wonders of art? No, you don't want anything. You have voluntarily taken the veil, closed yourself up in this shell. I'd like to smash it to pieces this minute. He raised his fist in the direction of the balcony in town. Alexandra Sergeyevna looked at him with satisfaction. He is handsome. She was somehow embarrassed. The cool of spring from the balcony, the heat of the lamp and candles, the scent of all the delicious things that were on the table, some kind of special combination, even the light and air, something special that was never present in this living room. These words, these gestures. Over there are some poems. The night is so poetic, and he's a poet himself. But it wouldn't hurt to close the door to the balcony. It was all right for him in his thick frock coat, but she was in barrage. And it was probably her rheumatism, too. <laughs> she was listening. She had forgotten that at the beginning of their meeting, she'd been praised for her ability to renounce everything, isolate herself, and so on. She found it pleasant that she had been scolded. She felt something long unknown, a little flutter of her heart, a certain trembling, as if everything inside suddenly vanished. It had been like this long ago, during a mazurka at a festival. And somewhere off to the side, the talk goes quite far, and you're waiting and waiting any minute now, and nothing. And tomorrow there's waiting too. He will come. And you deliberately detain Papa at home just in case, and at the same time you give him an issue of the Muscovite so he won't get in the way. He falls asleep in his office. And then you wait. A vert président dress. There is a fashionable color called that in honor of Napoleon III. Altasov was still talking. She held perfectly still, listening to the sounds, not the words. I think that we'll go into Karen, is that right? Is that, yeah. So Karen, I'm switching the sound on for you. Okay. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Okay. Let me know if I'm not speaking loudly enough or clearly enough. I'd like to talk about, um, you know, and, and read an abridged, slightly abridged version of the last chapter of my translation in progress of Nadia Khlashinskaya's sizable but important 1870-1871 novel, Ursa Major, which was also her most popular. But maybe first talk a little bit about the work contextually in relationship to maybe astronomy and its place in Russian literature for those less familiar. The constellation Ursa Major or the Great Bear serves as the title, but also a motif in Hlaschinska's novel set in a small provincial town from 1854 to 58, during and immediately after the Crimean War, amid the often comically rampant adulterous flirtations of virtually all the characters. The constellation and its seven brightest stars also serve as a symbol for the more seriously treated romance of Katya Vagranskaya and the married Andrei Verhoskoy, while drawing on ancient myth and religious tradition, as well as especially Alexander Pushkin's earlier novel and verse, Eugene Onegin of 1825 to 32, and greatly influencing Leo Tolstoy's 1875 to 6 novel, Anna Karenina. Interestingly, Klaschinskaya resists these other more tragic treatments of the theme of adultery to enable her idealistic young heroine to choose an unusually independent life for a woman as a teacher for the peasants on the eve of the abolishment of serfdom in 1861. Now, according to one version of the myth associated with Ursa Major, the married Zeus deceitfully transformed himself into the likeness of the goddess Artemis or Diana, her Roman name, to ravish her follower Callisto. He then transformed Callisto into a bear to protect her from Artemis's wrath after discovering the girl's pregnancy. But other versions suggest that Artemis herself transformed Callisto into a bear after learning of Zeus's dishonest deed. According to Ovid, Callisto's son Arcus failed to recognize his mother as a bear in the forest and tried to shoot her, prompting Zeus to transform them into Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. More recently, the scholar Kathleen Wall has suggested that the virginal Artemis and fallen mortal Callisto may represent a later patriarchal split, similar to the Virgin Mary and fallen Mary Magdalene arising from a former more integrated image of the goddess. The number seven repeatedly cited in the novel as the sum of Ursa Major's brightest stars holds a special place in Christian religious tradition. For example, the apostle John in the Bible's book of Revelation sees a vision of Jesus standing among seven golden lampstands with seven stars in his hand often in interpreted as his guidance of the seven churches of the time to safety after the apocalypse. Klaschinskaya draws on these mythological and religious traditions is also partly reflected in Pushkin's Eugene Onegin, and also, I might add, Tolstoy's War and Peace. In Pushkin's novel, Tatiana encounters Artemis's totem animal, a bear, in the forest in a dream, which leads her protectively to a hut to warm up. Pushkin later le links Tatiana, already in love with Eugene, directly to Artemis in her association with the moon, using the goddess's Roman name, Diana, and observing that his heroine sat, quote, alone and sad under the window illuminated by Diana's light, end quote. Unwilling to sacrifice his dis dissolute lifestyle to marry Tatiana, Eugene returns to Petersburg and she marries a wealthy older man despite her apparent lack of love for him. Later, Eugene attends a party at their home and seems to rue his mistake in spurning her love, but she behaves coldly, rejecting the possibility of an adulterous romance, apparently. Rashtinskaya connects her heroine Katya to Pushkin's Tatiana through her allusions to the mythology associated with Artemis and Ur Ursa Major. Katya also must triumph over the perils of male conquest after marrying the married Andre tries to seduce her to become his mistress. Early in the novel, he confesses to suffering from a spiritual malaise, gazing out a window at night and observing that he sees in his life only 
quote, some pale, cold murk, end quote. Katya immediately responds, quote, untrue, don't abuse the night. You probably see poorly. Over there, lower, one, two, and even more, all seven, Ursa Major, end quote. Instead of existential meaninglessness, Ursa Major inspires Katya with faith and hope. Later brooding over the obstacle of his wife, Vidya, to his romance with Katya, Andre peers out the window of his hotel room to see, quote, seven stars shown in the heights, end quote, and addresses the constellation, quote, Katya, why is it you shine for me from a distance, always dreams, always phantoms, end quote. Andre's words reflect his own dualistic view of Katya as either a distant, virginal, and unattainable feminine ideal or the debased object of his own domination and conquest. In a final effort to press her to accompany him to Petersburg as his mistress, he assures her, quote, no one will find out, end quote. But she again refuses, telling him she loved the civic-minded and honest man in him. When he asks her, quote, and were you deceived? Were you deceived? She responds, quote, no, but faith without deeds is dead. Quote. Although Andre's love for Katya seemingly resurrects his former youthful faith in idealism inspired originally, apparently by his mother's example, he remains too highly invested in a social system which bestows greater power and wealth on men. Katya responds by demonstrating her mastery of the lessons underlying the myth of Ursa Major by ultimately breaking off their romance while offering hope for the future, telling him, quote, let me go with love. And here's my first vow to you. Wherever I may be, call me. I'll come. I'm yours. Unquote. However, on her way home alone in the dark, she sadly observes, you'll never call me. Krasinska's novel greatly influenced Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Levin notices the constellation Ursa Major while bear hunting and asks his friend Steve if Kitty, the latter's sister-in-law, has married yet. Kitty also asks about the bear hunt at dinner before she and Levin appear to acknowledge their love for each other at the card table. Their romance seemingly offers a more positive contrast to Anna Karenina's adulterous love for Vronsky, which ends in her violent death. While recognizing the challenge presented by Levin's own urge toward conquest as reflected in his love of bear hunting. At the, no at the end of the novel, Katya stands under the night sky in her home in the countryside, admiring the real life comet named for astronomer Giovanni Donati, which appeared in the constellation Ursa Major in 1858 and 59. While often considered a bad omen, comets, but also the number seven, are said to portend the apocalypse and second coming of Christ. Stopping at a way station for fresh horses while passing through to visit his new country estate with his second wife after Lydia's death, Andre learns that Katya lives nearby with her former housemaid, Masha. This is from part five, the last part of the novel and the last chapter, chapter eight. I better have some water. More than three years passed. An evening at the end of September 1858, a travel carriage and coach behind it drove up to the postal station house in a hamlet on a large but rather remote road. Because of such important travelers, the station master went out into the porch. A footman, after leaping out of the carriage, requested fresh horses. A gentleman who had awakened during the stopover and a lady who was sleeping soundly were inside the coach. Negotiations with the station master continued for a long time. The gentleman lowered his window and called out to his footman, what's going on over there? There aren't any horses, Your Excellency. They, they say there won't be any earlier than tonight. The mail coach is due to pass through here soon. A troika of horses has been made ready in advance only for it. The gentleman returned to the coach. 
Alexandrine, are you awake? We have to wait here, dear. It's chilly outside. Let's go into the station. He'd said this in French. Some bystanders had been gathering around the porch. Oh, maybe it's filthy in there, the lady said. Her hat and a box of candy, which the station master grabbed, and a small greyhound, which her housemaid caught, rolled out after her. Oh, the lady exclaimed, climbing onto the porch. Oh, please, so we don't have to see that. She pointed at the fiery red band, which had risen in the sky. The windows are on the other side, the station master reassured the male traveler, who reassured the lady. When the footman appeared again, he attracted a group around him. He relayed that his master worked for the sovereign himself. After his spouse had died, he'd received her patrimonial estates. They were driving out to one of them and had gotten married again not long ago. The young lady just had graduated from the institute. He was a very high-ranking gentleman. This information alarmed the poor station master. You may trust my conscience, he apologized to the gentleman when the latter, after getting his wife settled, had returned to the room where the station master was seated. If you'd permit me to take a look at a book, everyone else is out, but right now for the mail. That's all right, the traveler obligingly replied. My wife is going to rest in the meantime. It'll do her good. He's exhausted, Your Excellency. You wish to drive so far. Yes. She wanted some tea. Do you have any decent water? The station master lavished praise on his wellspring and vowed that the samovar had been tinned only a week ago. The traveler was able to be assured of it right away. His housemaid entered with a glass of tea. The lady asked me to say that she personally brewed it, and you absolutely must have some. Tell her I kiss her little hands, the gentleman replied, took out a cigar, examined a chair, and sat down near a candle. He seemed to be under 40 years of age, perhaps younger. There wasn't any gray noticeable in his golden hair. His beard was very becoming to his handsome face. Do you have any newspapers? As if to reassure the station master, the bell of the postal coach sounded at that very moment, ever nearer and nearer, and finally, in a thunder of wheels and a merry shout, came to a standstill at the porch. The station master started to bustle about, but all this soon ceased. The postman placed a small bundle on the table, spoke a bit with the station master, went out to get something to eat, and after a few moments, a new troika, jingling, darted from the porch. We only get any entertainment once a week, the station master said, urged on by his guest's goodwill. You'd want some newspapers, so here, if you please. There's also a journal and a new book. But then, isn't it yours, the traveler asked, reaching out his hand for the book. It doesn't matter, sir. I'm allowed. He didn't finish speaking. Who's this? The traveler asked, seemingly not in his own voice and pointing at the package's printed address. She, sir? She's one of them around here. A landowner? No, sir. It's just she lives around here. It's already been three years. Alone? Yes, sir. I, I don't know. A young woman or girl also is with her. How does she live around here? Just so, simply, sir. She bought the farmstead from a free peasant. She lives simply like a peasant. What does she do? But everything, both in her field and kitchen garden. She taught all the children in the village afresh. She teaches all day in the winter and even the adults. Whoever wants to do so, she invites everyone to her place. I heard she's from a noble family. He's, she's very well educated, has a great many books, and even gets foreign ones. But she lives like she's a peasant. I really don't know how she got an urge to be that way. I advised her to get to know the landowners. It'd be all the more advantageous in a pinch if some need arose. I'll manage, she says. I'll manage, the traveler repeated to himself. Where does she live? The station master looked up and was struck dumb. 
but on the road, on the way out, at the very end, would you like the door opened, Your Excellency? It's stuffy. Would you like to lie down here? Well, with the book. No, it, it's late. It's all of nine o'clock, Your Excellency, but if you don't wish to read, I'll just send along the book to her. It's Sunday today. She's freer. Send it. I'm going to take a walk. The station master went out onto the porch and issued an order. The boy of 13, after receiving the book, couldn't stand still. Take a lantern. You'll get there more quickly. And don't be tardy. But then whenever you're sent anywhere, you just never get there in time. The traveler walked behind him, hastening so as not to lose sight of him. The area had become all the more remote and deserted. The black rippling belt of buildings spread out more expansively, broke off suddenly on one side, and a field shone white instead of it. The field was endless. Above it was the sky's fiery throb. The comet's gleaming tail bowed over in a sheath. Sparks seemed to spill from it, and shadows raced along the ground. Light from the last hut's window reached as far as the road. A small group of common folk had gathered at the doors. Approaching nearer, he could count the people and make out their faces. The errand boy lingered there, too. He addressed someone, probably accomplishing his mission. Shine the light better. Let's see what you brought with you, a voice sounded. The boy raised his lantern high. The traveler had hung back at the pole of a draw well. What was undulating before him had vanished. In a flash of light and shadow, as tempting as a fleeting dream, as sweet as joy, blossoming fresh, strong, and free, in a beauty eternally young and bright. And what had appeared before him, he closed his eyes, wanted to flee at frozen place. The quivering light had steadied and illuminated her completely. She was pointing upward after lifting her face. Her black braid had been thrown over her shoulder in a long coil. The thick folds of her blouse lie aloft on her breast and fell as far as her loose sash. Its broad red ends rustled against her checkered Fanyova peasant skirt. She was speaking. He could hear her words too, but better than that was her voice. Encouraging, affectionate, and merry, freedom, joy, and conviction were expressed in it. Elderly gas and sighs also could be heard, but already questions, well-reasoned talk, and something sure and reliable had begun to take their place. Simple, youthful laughter and later talk and jokes rose. A dear voice sounded amid it all, as clear as happiness. The stars seemingly all had paled. What did you call these others above it? The boy asked. Ursa Major. What wonders? I'm happy I stayed. The little circle dispersed. She remained alone and stood and gazed at the lovely, lovely seven stars in the heights above the pillar of fiery dust. Plunging into a reverie, having become lost in thought, she folded her hands. Gotcha, sounded from the darkness. Bagranskaya gave a start, listened. She couldn't see anyone. It's late, and tomorrow she had so many things to do. Thank you. There's a lot of ambiguity in this um, novel, and uh, among them is the fact that she um, asked him to call her and she would come. But um, she, it, I guess it remains a question of whether she heard him at the end and or whether she did hear him and did not go to him. Thank you.
don't actually have a question. I just have a yeah. I just have a thank you, which is I love all of these works so much, and it was so wonderful to hear the sort of range of Hoshinskaya's work, and they're all so different. So thank you all for the work that you're doing. And I know it's early, and there will be questions, but I also, I'm not going to take the mic again, so I just want to also thank Anna and Hilda, because it was an amazing conference, and this is such an amazing end to it, to really see the works coming into broader circulation. So um, thank you. our translators come up together so they could actually talk a little bit about the act of translating. We asked them not to do that too much with each individual work because we didn't want overlap, but I think there are a lot of interesting translation issues and this is the chance to think about those. So if we want to bring up the three who are here. because <laughs> Karen has her own chair. Uh, one thing that uh, you may notice is that we're all pronouncing the last name Hvoshinskaya and Kwashinskaya a little bit differently because in the course of the conference, those of us who were not aware that uh, um, of what is prob that probably the correct pronunciation is with the uh, accent on the first syllable, and we've all these I have for 25 years been calling her Kwashinskaya, but there are strong arguments for. <laughs> so some of so some of us are going back and forth. Some of us are already in the habit um, of saying Foschenskaya, but it seems that is it, and it's a very difficult name. So in terms of kind of marketing her to the world, um, we're trying to think of ways to maybe simplify it, playing around with something even like the Sisters K, which I think Hilda mentioned in her introductory remarks. Anyway, um, if anybody has any questions for the four of us, otherwise we can just talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, the sisters are a little bit difficult to translate, so for instance, in Eric's translation of the meeting, you could hear there was a lot about money. And that's kind of typical of her work. She's, um, she's really marvelous for anybody interested in the workings of 19th century Russia, in bureaucratic corruption, in the nobility's, uh, some portion of the nobility's reliance on debt and kind of the banking system. So I think we're all, we struggle a little bit with making that easy for uh, Western readers and not burdening them with too many complicated footnotes about various institutions, although for some people I think that would probably be very interesting to learn about. Um, so uh, Eric and I, read each other's translations, and he helped me a lot um, figuring out um, there's, this, there's this one term uh, that features in the climax of the brother called, um, the term is billet prikaza, that really puzzled me. So at, at there are going to be some spoilers. We've already had a <laughs> spoiler for the ending of Ursa <laughs> Major. So, Brat, it's in the climax um, that the novella centers around um, the brother's effort to um, get a 5,000 ruble inheritance out of his older sister that she wants to use to ensure the happiness of the younger sister who is in love with a, a, a low ranking bureaucrat clerk, I guess, essentially. Um, and so 
finally she gives in and she takes the billet prikaza and puts it on the table. And I had a sense of what it was, but first of all, I was uh, confused by billet, which is just the piece of paper that represents deposited money in this institution, in this prikaz, which I knew was the name of government institutions in long before the 19th century, and I thought they didn't exist anymore, but then it turned out there was this one remaining prikaz, this one remaining kind of semi-governmental agency, prikaz abshestvinov prizrenia, which was functioning as kind of a sav savings and loan. So this aunt who had bequeathed the money to the sister um, had her money deposited there, and then other members of the nobility, they would borrow money from that institution and pay interest, so basically it functioned as a savings and loan. And Eric introduced me to a marvelous book uh, with a lot of details. So it's only in Russian. What is hard to understand in the classics? And um, it explained both the prikaz and the bilyev. So, um, yes. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, actually for all of, our, all of you because um, when you were reading your wonderful translations, I uh, I was mm, happy because I've heard even uh, even though I am not a native English speaker speaker, I was happy that I've heard that you retain all of you retain tr or try to retain uh, uh, free and direct discourse or free and direct thought to put it uh, neurotologically more correctly, because Hvoshinska's prose is full of free and direct discourse or free and direct thought, and in meeting, in Bratet's brother, in not in first fight, because it's, it's, for, it's from first person, and of course in, in uh, Ursa Major. So my question is, uh, to what extent do you realize when you are working on this? To what extent do you realize how to, how to treat this, how to translate uh, free and direct discourse in English? So what, what, are you, what do you feel when you approaching, when you approaching this? Thank you. Thanks for that question. This is actually something I thought a lot about, um, both because the first thing I ever read about translation was Rachel Mays, the translator in the text, and she has a whole chapter on this exact issue. And also because I was comparing different, all the publications of Svidanya that I knew of, and it came out in 1879, but it was reprinted in 1880, 1892, and 1913. And what I learned is that the, the editors of the Polnaya Sobrania Sechenenia, the collected works of Hoshinskaya, that a lot of us rely on in our, our, our reading of her and our scholarship, uh, it's very heavily edited to remove free indirect discourse. Like it, they, they, they take pronouns and they put in proper names for clarity. Uh, they rephrase sentences and combine sentences, and they especially try to attribute the narrator's speech to a specific character. So instead of this phenomenon you're talking about where it's the third person narrator speaking, but we can tell that it's one of the character's perspectives coming through that third person voice, they will split it up into a pure narrator voice and, and stuff in quotes. Um, so I tried to follow the 1880 text, which was the last one that came out while Hvoshinsky was still alive, which had all that free and direct discourse preserved. Um, so I just, you know, I, the other issue that Rachel May talks about is that this is something that was, Russian writers did a lot in the 19th century, and in the English literary tradition, it was more considered like kind of clumsy or bad taste or something. So if you keep it all, you're maybe putting your work in a different, it, it maybe feels different to the English reader than it would to the Russian reader. Um, I still come down on the side of, I'd like to do what the Russian writer was doing and keep the free and direct discourse, and I tried to do that. And I'm glad if it came through in the reading it out loud, because that was also something I thought would be hard. But on the page, you can at least tell. But Thank do you guys have thoughts about? Thank you, Eric. It's very important to retain and to, to, to reserve it because, and it's awful that they edit it. I, I didn't know, so thank you so much for this information. It's very, very, very extremely important. Yeah, I had noticed the free indirect discourse, you know, originally in the first translation I, I did of her works, a boarding school girl, 
you know, and I, I mean, it's, I think it's particularly important to keep with this writer because there's a lot of ambiguity in general and, and voice throughout all of her works. I mean, she wrote with a masculine pseudonym. So you have to also take into consideration and, and sort of create your own stance to how you feel about the narrator, you know, when the, you know, outside of, you know, di direct discourse. So you've got that as well as this Ex really quite extreme at times penetration of the narrative by other voices so you know it's really makes kind of an orchestral effect at times or something so it's a, a very inter interesting phenomenon I, I think in her case because it's complicated by the addition of you know the masculine pseudonym and and how you want to uh interpret the narrative voice is it a man is it a woman is it both is it, is she, is it, is it really a reflection of all these other strings of characters' voices? Um, at times it becomes very difficult to, I think, especially, I think it's so, it's very noticeable when you're translating her works. So I, I think you do have to take a position to it, and it can be a little bit difficult in English. I think part of the reason why, you know, it, it's edited out you know, in English is we like to, um, we, we seem to like to uh, have everything cut and dried, <laughs> you know, and you do see uh, things changed into uh, direct speech with quotes quite often. You know, but that whole trend came, you know, of free indirect discourse, you know, came through you know, uh, Madame Bovary too, through, you know, so it was a, at least in Europe and in, in Russia, you know, a, a pretty common, um, you know, device. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'm really glad that Alexei has brought this up because um, it's something that really makes it difficult to explain to English language audiences how does Kwasinska's style differ or what are the similarities to the big, you know, the, the big baggy monsters of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Because when Eric was reading his translation, that, you know, that at least when you're listening to it, that's just like Henry James. So to an English language ear, this sounds and looks like a modernist novel. But the way, you know, the way we're thinking about it is something that is published at the same cultural and literary milieus as the pre-modernist, right? The big 19th century classic realist novel. And that is something that, to be honest, when I read Wyszynski in Russian, is not as noticeable. So it's when you translate it into English that it suddenly sounds like modernist English prose. Um, and that's certainly something that I think we might need to think about in terms of how we explain to English language readers why it's interesting to read. Um, and which might not be as relevant as we talk to people who, when, who read it in Russian. Because to be honest, I haven't noticed it when I was reading it in Russian. <laughs> it's only the English translation that really... Because exactly as you say, Russian writers do this all the time. Whereas this free and direct speech, especially kind of in the critical tradition, is highly associated with Henry James and the modernist novel. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I also have a quick question, if that's all right. Um, you mentioned that one of the differences about Hwashinska's prose, Hwashinska's prose, is that it's set in the provinces. And I wondered if there were anything that you have found as translators that was difficult to tr translate because it's a different world from the kind of Moscow and St. Petersburg-based novels of Tolstoy and, and Dostoevsky. Was there any kind of, I don't know, resign specific words or something that relates to the life in the provinces that was very difficult or challenging to translate? Thank you. Okay, well, um, uh, sure, <laughs> it's a very different world. Um, I know there were examples in The Brother of that, but the one that immediately comes to my mind is from City Folk and Country Folk, which starts out in the very first sentence talking about um, temporary obligated serfs. So it introduces the heroine of the novel as uh, the 
first of all, Pamishitsa, which is really, you can't precisely tr uh, translate because it is a landowner who is noble and owns serfs. So there's kind of three meanings right in there. So I just said the mistress, she was the mistress of 50 souls um, who were at that point, because the serfs had just been liberated, temporarily obligated, which had to do with all kinds of complicated provisions in the proclamation, um, 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 in the um, liberation manifestation, emancipation of the serfs and the subsequent land reforms. So I just hated in the very first paragraph of this novel that I'm hoping a broad readership will read to have them have to kind of trip over this long footnote explaining it. <laughs> And so I, I, I've wondered in retrospect whether you know it really would have lost anything if I had just said the recently emancipated serfs and not even used the word temporarily obligated. <laughs> um, you know, if it had been deeper in the novel and I already had the reader engaged in the story, but I'm afraid they're going to read this first sentence. Uh, I don't know. It's too complicated. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's certainly. Uh, aspects of the Russian nobility and the whole system of uh, land ownership, both before and after the liberation of the serfs, that make it complicated. I'm not uh, coming up with a specific um, example. How about you, Eric? Um, on the on whether it was hard to do things from the provinces in Rizan, there were a bunch of small issues, like um, there were animals that came up and beverages and ethnic groups and social estates and to somebody who lived in Rizan at the time they would have understood all these things as being southern right so each of the like I could translate each one as as ground squirrels kumis uh, I, I forget what I did with Advorzi, I did a I think a, a, a work around where I said like not much more than a peasant or something like that um, so each of those was a challenge on its own and what I think I, I did not find a solution for was a way to make it clear that those things all go together as southern features I basically just said that in the introduction, and if, if you didn't read the introduction, you probably won't notice. <laughs> and did Karen have anything to add, or? Okay. Well, I think there's that problem, but what, for me, what is, is kind of overriding, I mean, working with native speakers even, you know, some of the language is old fashioned enough that even as, even native speakers sometimes don't know what the word means, whether it's a regional variation, you know, or had a slightly different meaning then, and occasionally they have no clue themselves what the word means. So it gets more serious as you go along, <laughs> you know, of course, I'm, you know, starting pretty early, you know, still a fairly early draft with, you know, Ursa Major right now. But, um, you know, that's one thing that I guess I shouldn't have been completely surprised about. But, um, you know, that just complicates a job for the translator trying to separate, you know, what is old fashioned and what is maybe regional. I guess I just wanted to say, in my case, um, I think I'm facing less problems with that because precisely the the main voice of the narrator is trying to basically uh, 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 bring with him everything that he has carried on from the Moscow salons, and my my job has been to sort of figure out actually the slang of the Moscow salons and ways that you know maybe some things are actually completely inflated by him. Um, and but of course the minute and and I think the presence of peasants in the text is so minimal. It's basically brought down I think to the to almost nothing. But the minute that they come up, I already immediately face problems like with words like diruga. Uh, I really uh, so as in the end I translated as a sackcloth. But I, it took me a long time and I had to talk to my grandmother about it and and ask <laughs> what 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 <laughs> what is that. Um, yeah, but in that sense, for me, because I think the nature of the, narr the narrative saves me at the moment, uh, this difficult uh, work that you are facing with Bratitz and... and <coughs> 
I wanted to maybe remind Karen of something in the novel that she's translating that I found very confusing um, and kind of had to really go back and read and, and figure out. There's a, an ins instance in fairly early in Ursa Major where um, the main male protagonist, this kind of flawed man, he's just arrived in this provincial town and he gets a ride from someone, um, and um, I guess that person is one of the state serfs, or he's some kind of a coachman, and, and the Verkovskoy is asking him whether, um, whether he's well treated. It was just a very, very confusing, the, the whole, um, one of the main characters is in charge of all the state serfs who live in the province. Uh, do you remember the, the passage I'm talking about fairly early on, Karen? And uh, how did you- I think you so. I mean, you know, the position of the serfs at that time, you know, is, you know, very central to this novel. And, and the, um, you know, there's been a lot of discontent in some of the villages, it, you know, the village that he wants to purchase and the estate, you know, that he wants to purchase. And, and I think if I'm remembering the, the, you know, part you're talking about there, you know, he starts hearing rumors from various people about, you know, what went down in this, you know, out here in this village. And so that's going to affect his decision, you know, whether to buy this estate, although it's really with his wife's money. So I'm not sure, you know, how much he feels invested in it, at least initially. But, you know, I, I kind of, you know, what you were just talking about, Nora, is, you know, a, a really er, earlier you were speaking about the problem of the institutions, you know, um, government institutions within these novels. That is is a tremendous problem, probably, you know, for most of us, because she really, you know, the, the, you, you see the institutions operating, and it's probably even more a critical in Ursa Major because, you know, at the center of the novel is considerable government corruption <laughs> at all levels. So you really have to, you know, delve into how much power did the governor have? Did the, you know, the police force, what parts of the police force uh, reported directly to the governor? Who, or did they report, you know, did they have intermediary intermediate reporting lines. I mean, all this becomes important, the government structure and and also the financial, and it's it occurs in this novel too, the, the structure of the financial institutions too. What were people doing with money? You know, there's a lot of money exchanged hands in Ursa Major, you know, people buying property, but also, you know, you, you know there's discussion of uh, a lot of bribery going on. So, you know, to really, I mean, I don't think, I, I know I did not understand at first at, at that level at all. And, you know, that's been one useful, really useful thing in translating is I've been forced to, you know, do some more of this background, you know, historical reading about the institutions and how they operated, um, you know, you, you know, also things like, you know, at that time, the serfs were, you know, or, you know, peasants were, you know, there were a lot of uprisings, you know, on estates at that time, um, you know, partly with the war going on, too, of being forced to uh, into the draft. So, and also how people were paid off and bribed to avoid the draft too. So uh, there's just in, incredible amounts of, um, you know, social relationships and institutions involved here. I'm sure that, you know, you know, probably all the, uh, the other translators were involved in dealing with that as well. I, I do have, oh. Um, so we've sorry, uh, we've received an email from Candice Wheel. Um, I would like to respond. Um, 
Could you ask your guest speakers translators if they could comment further on about the use of dialogue to reveal not only self-perception of character, their personal relationships and the realities of the day, uh, but also the conflict between the character's self-perception and the way the readers receive the character. Uh, the use of dialogue that reveals an assumption by Kvoshinska of a shared higher human value with her readers of what is morally true and good against which um, uh, the social themes which truly need to change are suggested uh, and again seemingly understood and shared with the reader. Uh, and the idea of youth not knowing itself, not recognizing in itself the significance of their own thoughts, feelings and actions and how this dynamic moves towards revealing the center of gravity of the author's concern. Um, okay, uh, uh, in, in some way I consider Pierre Barba a kind of anti-Bildungsroman, right? We're actually dealing with someone who's coming to age without having actually gone through the experience of growing uh, or learning anything about life. In fact, I actually think the, the whole, the, the fundamental tension of the struggle that the narrator keeps talking about is in fact to remain as unchanged as possible, right? He has to undergo a particular uh, compromise at the end of the, uh, uh, of the text. But, but uh, this compromise, the minute that he receives the money from the bourgeois woman that he uh, uh, essentially was holding off from doing that because that would ruin his uh, kind of proud image of an aristocrat, the minute that the money is received, he sort of uh, reverts immediately back to the performative aspect of his identity. Uh, and another aspect about this um, specific character is that it's actually very difficult to tell how performative this identity really is, right? And how much the this inner tr feeling is sincere that in fact actually his he has been somehow wronged from uh, birth and being born to sort of the wrong parents, then is somehow his fate is corrected and now he has to recorrect back again, right? And, and so in that sense, the, the, the act of learning is minimal. Um, and <laughs> and, and uh, in, in a way, by hearing himself speak in dialogues, I believe that he's constantly just reaffirming again and again uh, um, uh, that he is in fact carrying on in the right um, sort of mannerism in order to keep affirming uh, this uh, largely unfounded position. Um, so, yes, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, that's an excellent question with a lot of good parts that I'm not sure I'll be able to do all of it justice. Um, but I feel like um, the dialogue in the meeting, a lot of it is leaving things implied, kind of unclear, but it's revealing a lot of deviousness and calculation of some of the characters. Um, but among the young characters, I think, it, it seems to me that there's a pattern in some of the Hvoshinskaya works I've read where young people are spontaneous and genuine and sincere, and then if they get the wrong kind of education, which happens when they're separated from their parents, which happens in both the first struggle and the meeting, and, and Bratis, yeah, yeah, then they go wrong, right? And, and then they're irredeemably bad. <laughs> um, so we do have, we have scenes in, the, in parts of the meeting that I didn't read where we have the young Anna Vasilevna and her, her young progressive friends um, saying good, spontaneous, sincere things to each other. Uh, but mo that's, that's, there's less dialogue in that part. And most of the dialogue is used for the, the kind of psychological games between Alexander Sergeyevna and, and Pyotr Nikolaevich and things like that. Um, yeah. Nora, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I don't have too much to say about Brat. It's uh, about the brother in that regard. Um, the house uh, where the three sisters live is a very quiet house. There is quite a bit, especially once the brother comes on the scene, there's quite a bit of dialogue. And I, I like the, uh, the comment that Eric made, just the division between normal kind of sincere um, and functional dialogue and then the brother being interjected into this house was is very manipulative. Everything that comes out of his, his mouth is to um, 
achieve some goal or just kind of um, stick it to somebody who is maybe getting a little bit too self-confident or wanting something for themselves. And um, But yeah, other than that, I, I don't have any comments. I, d I did want to actually, though, just go back um, a little bit to the, the question um, about the, I, so I am a lowly master's, uh, master of art. I do not have a PhD. I do not write about literature very much, so I'm not as competent in talking about it as my, my colleagues here. But um, uh, the, the question of the, the free direct discourse, that's the term? That Alexei free, indirect. free and direct discourse, right. Um, just uh, something that's interesting to think about with um, the sisters is that they use pseudonyms. So there are so many layers to the voice of the narrator. First of all, we know they're women. The writer is a woman, but the pseudonyms are male. And in the novel that I translated, um, City Folk and Country Folk, you have this really delicious extra layer of you have one of the main characters, kind of an anti-hero, writes for the sort of journal the novel was first published in, and we see him in the novel writing for such a journal, and we can, s and he's writing and describing the reality the novel is describing, but distorting it terribly. <laughs> so I, I think that's one of the things I love about the novel so much is that you have all of these layers. It's kind of the you know Chinese restaurant with the two mirrors, and they're reflecting back and forth, and you're seeing all these different things. There's just so many layers to that narration that you can play with, and I think that's something that Nadezhda is also good with too, but I, I just haven't studied that as much. Can I just say one more thing? Uh, I was thinking about the question of the dialogue. I think especially in the beginning of Pierre Barba, when um, there is a moment when the father um, reappears, and he reappears sort of sporadically and very spontaneously, and Sergei is completely not expecting this appearance in his life. And the, the power of the dialogue, of the sincerity of sort of a loving, uh, looking forward to finally uh, coming together again that comes from the father and the sort of artificial, full of mannerism response of the little boy. And we have to keep in mind this boy is 13 years old the whole time. But the way he talks with the inf in sort of inflated air, I think that the dialogue in this case really is used as a sense of this estrangement, this kind of astranenia. You, you are completely recognized the, the, the power of the contrast between the two. Well, I'd like to, um, I guess, add to, I mean, for me, there's two major strains in her narrative. The direct speech, which her conversation is, is really, um, you know, it's very lively. I, I think you, all of you people really, you know, captured it very nicely. Um, and that's what really breathes life, I think, into her works and makes them tremendously fun to read. Her, you know, command of, of dialogue is incredible. And yet she, you know, in terms of the question and in re rendering it, she, as Eric, I think, was alluding to, the characters oftentimes leave their thoughts not, you know, not completed. You know, there's always, there's so, uh, I mean, there's more marks of ellipsis in the, in most of these texts than almost words at times. You know, so it, it can of, often be kind of difficult as a translator to, if you, you know, if you feel there's openness there to, to leave it. And yet, um, I, you know, I think it kind of um, compares or matches perhaps in a way the, the same kind of, a different kind of ambiguity that goes on with the free and direct discourse because the, the narrative voice is often shot through with irony. So whether you, whether the narrator expects you to treat the situation um, directly, or whether you're expected to perhaps interpret it 
with irony or you know or the you know is it's sometimes up to question too and i think as a translator yeah, I, I think my approach as a translator is to try to if possible retain as much of that tension as possible you know, to not cut it off you know because i think in her works in particular that openness that occurs in both of in both of those types of areas is very important and and in the, the dialogue is the you know in, in regard to this particular question it occurs in the dialogue too so it you know it's kind of a it's a somewhat of a problem there too a translation problem anyway I think on that note, we'll just say a huge thank you to our translators for the fabulous readings and the really interesting discussion. Um, it was a true pleasure to hear all of you, and we hope that many more will have the chance to share this later online. So thank you. And thank you to Pushkin House for giving us this venue. It's such a special place, and it's an honor to be here. <laughs>